here we explore a version of libertarianism that includes agent causation. And we're looking in particular at the type that Timothy O'Connor develops. In part one, we'll just look at the theory itself, what he has to say about the theory. And then in part two, we'll consider some objections to the theory. This is a common sense approach, according to Tim O'Connor. He says, look, um, it seems to me as if my actions are often up to me. So I bring my actions about directly. So you might say, for example, I chose to watch this video now, right? It seems like you did that directly. And O'Connor goes on to say, well, right, my actions are not the result of a succession of causes into the distant past like a hard determinist might claim, right? I'm interrupting that series of causes in some way. So O'Connor argues that the common sense view of ourselves, it, that we are not wholly moved movers, right? That we act sometimes in ways when we haven't been acted upon in order to act that way, that this is theoretically understandable, first of all, it's not mysterious entirely. It's internally consistent, okay, it makes sense, the account he provides, and it's consistent with what we know about the world, right? It's consistent with contemporary science. So he claims all of those things about his version of agent causation. So just as a broad overview or summary, O'Connor says, of course, all objects have inherent causal properties that make them dynamic, or we might say inherently active. And that's what event causation is about. So for example, if you have a piece of copper wire in front of you, well, it has this inherent capacity to expand to a certain degree when heated, to bend without breaking, but also to break when, when you're testing its tensile strength, right? When pulled on the ends, when sufficient force is applied, it'll break. It has the capacity to conduct electricity and so on. So copper has these properties. They are inherently active, right? But of course, it takes something happening to them or around them in order for those properties to be revealed or manifested in some way. So this is similar to vinegar sitting there and, and baking uh, soda sitting there, and then you, you mix them together and you know what's going to happen there. Now for humans, the idea is that we have these inherent causal properties as well, just like any other object does. And some of these causal capacities that we have are sometimes exercised. Now, most of them aren't, right? We have a certain mass. Uh, we also would have a certain tensile strength if you want to be, uh, ooh, uh, thinking about torture or something, right? But uh, we also have these special kinds of causal capacities that we can exercise. And these causal capacities then are directly acted upon by ourselves, right? We can prompt these properties to have their causal effects themselves. And we can also restrict certain properties from having their causal effects. So these are going to be obviously related to mental activities, not the general properties of our body uh, at, taken largely. And so we have intentions that bring about actions through these causal connections, the causal properties that we already have within us to act in certain ways. Now we need to think about causation a little bit more carefully. And O'Connor assumes that causation is best understood as a notion of production. And so he's rejecting reductive analyses of causation. He claims that those are false. So this is a, it's, it's a common view that he's taking, but he is ruling out uh, another view that is relatively common as well. And so the idea is that causal powers are directly related to the properties that a given object has. Again, think to the, back to the copper wire, it has certain properties, 
whatever causal powers that the copper wire has are directly related to the properties of that copper wire. And O'Connor draws upon this necessaritan, necess, necessitarian, sorry, account of event causation in order to ex, explicate agent causation, right? In order to explain what's going on with agent causation, he uses the idea that we have with uh, event causation. So the relationship between an object's properties and its causal powers is a logically necessary one, right? Whatever causal powers one thing has is related directly to its properties. And that's a logically necessary relationship that exists there. So let's talk more about agent causation. So we have that general way that causation works according to O'Connor, and it's a, it's a fairly common uh, view in metaphysics that causation works that way, directly related to properties. For example, David Armstrong and many others uh, have that view. And so the idea with agent causation, though, is that wherever the agent causal relation obtains, what's going on there is the agent bears a property or a set of properties that is volition enabling, right? So a, the, the property of the right sort can make possible the direct purposive effects by the agent. So whatever the agent is intending to do, it's based in this property that already exists, but the agent causes the effect, right? That the agent that has that property causes it to be, have its effects, right? Unlike a copper wire could do. And that causal power is exercised then at will by the agents. So what we have now is a, there is event causation and agent causation. They're both similar in the sense that whatever properties of thing has is logically necessarily related to the causal powers that it has. However, with event causation, right, the, the normal event causation, that applies uh, to anything and everything, right? But agent causation applies uniquely to intelligent, purposive agents. So that's a distinction then between agent causation and event causation. It's the agent, it's the person acting that brings about the effects with agent causation. All right, let's let's run through a little comparison and contrasting once more here. Try to be make this a little bit more clear. With agent causation, we have humans that are the originating point of some action, such as uh, choosing to watch this video now. Right, the fact that you're now watching this video, maybe maybe not. It was an example of agent causation. So these are such that they are sometimes free from the largely deterministic causal chain or causal network to which the rest of the world is subject. So we have this rare, relatively rare, all things considered, example of humans exercising our agent causal powers. Now that's in contrast to event causation. And sometimes, you know, when we think about causes in the world, we attribute the effects of something to an inanimate object. So we might say something like, the car caused the damage to the pole. You know, why is this pole knocked over? Well, a car caused the damage to it. But actually, we're speaking about events that involve these objects. So rather than the car causing the damage to the pole, it was the event of the movement of the car that caused the damage to the pole. So that's generally speaking, O'Connor says event causation is a good way of explaining what goes on in the world. In fact, we need to talk about events to talk about changes and causation uh, in the world, generally speaking. We have to do that. Of course, the exception then is with human beings and our ability to act upon certain of our properties causing the effects that are potentially there. Now, this brings up a concern here. Uh, Chisholm 
kind of went this path, right, when asked if humans have a divine ability, Chisholm kind of said, well, Roderick Chisholm, that is, says, yeah, uh, uh, maybe so. O'Connor makes it really clear uh, that, I've spelled his name wrong there, sorry about that, uh, describes free will as the ability to shape causal powers that are already present. So it's not like we create things out of nothing like God would do. We don't have this divine capacity to bring about an action ex nihilo. We have to have the causal properties, the, the capacities within us in order to activate them. Now, when we're talking about agent causation, we're typically going to be talking about emergent properties. And agent causation is consistent with materialism, O'Connor argues. Now, ultimately, O'Connor's a dualist when it comes to human beings, but he does want his view of libertarianism and agent causation to be consistent with materialism, and he argues that it is. He says, it might involve emergent properties. I said it does. Well, it might involve emergent properties. So what are these? Uh, very briefly, uh, going into some metaphysics here, emergent properties are macro properties that are generated by the properties of the underlying structure, the microstructure of the object, but whose role in the causal processes of the object are not going to be reducible to those of the micro property. So uh, as an example, um, consider that word micro properties that's there on your screen. Uh, just look at the M and its shape. Well, there are certain micro properties there uh, on your screen causing that shape to be visible. But that's there's also this, what we can reasonably call an emergent property so that we interpret that as an M, an important part of the word micro properties, right? So this is an emergent property that isn't inherently structured within the micro properties going on on the screen in the shape of that M. Something else is going on there uh, that is significant. So an agent that's acting freely has some emergent properties. This is one way that this is consistent with contemporary science, right? That enable the agent to bring about certain effects or to refrain certain effects from coming about. So that's agent causation, according to Tim O'Connor. And in part two, we'll look at some of the objections and how he responds to those.